likes this very much. Welcome to Coffee with Coffee, 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 Coffee. Let's do this! Good evening and welcome back to a brand new episode of Coffee with Toffees, guys. My name is Toffees, as you know. I am here bringing you a brand new episode at a special time. Uh, you can find me at Toffees underscore Dota 2. And before we start, I do want to send a big shout out to our sponsors, uh, Razor, the maker of the finest peripherals in esports, and Betway.com. Uh, if you want to place a bet with a company that has a uh, history of running online gambling for everything besides esports, and is now getting into esports, they're a great opportunity to sort of see somebody uh, that is known for trustworthy payouts. So check them out, guys. Uh, also, thank you to them for funding uh, small esports startups and helping me make the content that you've come to enjoy. Now, I am joined by a guest today that I'm very excited to welcome to the show. Uh, this is Paul Redeye Chaloner, who is um, the host of tons of events, has been shoutcasting for a very long time, but is here because he is going to be the host at an event that I know we're all excited about, and that is the International Five. How are you doing today, Red Eye? I'm very good. Yeah, I'm very good. Thanks for having me on the show as well. It's fun to be here. No problem. I appreciate you coming on. And uh, I think my goal here today is I want, I, I, I know a lot of folks probably know you from ESL and some other events that you've hosted yep. in the past, um, but you're still regarded largely as sort of this multi-game caster slash host. And there have been posts, even on the Reddit post today that I put up for questions, people saying, who is this guy? <laughs> so I really want to get a chance to sort of show you and and your process to the people who love Dota. A lot of people who watch the show know how important it is, I think, that talent is prepared and does a lot of work. Um, and I think that you are a good example of somebody who does that. Um, if you guys haven't seen it, and I'm going to plug this really quickly, you can search it online right now. And it is uh, Red Eye's Guide to Basically Casting and Hosting, um, a multi-part series that was released, what was that, two or three months ago, I think the last part came out? Uh, yeah, I think January, uh, January or February when I was back at ESL. But it's got a lot of good pointers, and most importantly, I think the thing that was really cool, Paul, as somebody who works sort of in the industry, and I've had, I've, I've gone to school for this, I've, I've sort of focused on training for performance and things like that, you yeah. gave us knowledge that you've accrued over years and years and years of performance for absolutely no charge. And as someone who's worked in the industry for a long time, I can tell you that that is incredibly rare. And I know myself, as well as a lot of other people, were very, very thankful for that. So I do want to take a second out, for, aside from the broadcast, aside from the interview, to say thank you uh, for being willing to share that information with all of us. Yeah, you're welcome. It's, uh, I, I guess, yeah, it is quite rare, but I, think, I don't think it's through any uh, ill motive. I think it's more about the fact that we're still very young and we're mm -hmm. still learning and we you know every event I've ever done I've I've learned more from it whether I've been a cast or a host or a producer I've I've always learned so you know I think it's it's not the definitive um, guide but hopefully you know people get what they want out of it and, and maybe learn a few things that yeah it literally it's what I've experienced if you like over the last mm -hmm. 13 or 14 years and later on in the show I'm actually gonna ask you a little bit about that um, dichotomy of sort of uh, bedroom casters becoming big versus yeah. uh, what we see in pro sports, which is paid, trained actors and performers sort of yeah. taking those jobs away. But we'll get to that in a little while. Also, real yeah. quick to address some folks uh, as to why I'm green, if you're watching this uh, on YouTube, it is because I'm moving and half of my normal equipment is already in boxes preparing to cross the country. Uh, so I don't have some of the typical lighting stuff that I would normally have for the show. So I apologize ahead of time. If you think I look sick, just pretend that I'm sick. Now, let's talk <laughs> about this shit. Let's talk about uh, Red Eye's history very briefly. I'm not going to go into your life story, um, but what I do think Good. is interesting is when I talked to Toby Wan in an interview, he talked about this thing that he did once upon a time back in the day, and it was called Shadow. Shoutcast Audio. Now, yep. you got your start in Shoutcast Audio back as early as 2002, I believe. Yes. Yeah, 2002. Um, I, I suppose it's very difficult to explain to people now that watch modern esports in the professional age that we're in with these you know, massive prize pots and uh, professional teams and jerseys and what have you. But back in the day, back in 2002, I played for one of the top teams around in Unreal Tournament. And um, because of that, what we had back then was uh, we had Euro Cup. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and Euro Cup was the be all and end all of everything online. It was like the greatest prize you could win in Europe um, for any of the games that were around at the time. So I played in a top team. We won the Euro Cup, um, and I can't remember exactly how the conversation started. But one of the admins at Clanbase basically asked me. He it was like, "You're English, yeah." <laughs> Uh, do some shoutcasting, and I was like, "What the hell is shoutcasting?" And he said, "Oh, it's you know, it's radio for video games. You know, you comment out the games." Like, really? Like, who would listen to that? And he was like, "No, no, it's becoming really big. It's it's going to be huge." Oh, okay. So he uh, he helped me out and got me set up with a guy. Um, I think I used Winamp shoutcast plugin for it. Uh, played a lot of dodgy boy band music and commentated on a game. And I think the early part for me was literally because I was a you know good player at the game. It was it was like ripping holes in other players' game that they were doing. So it would be daft stuff they did, or you know why were they standing there, or why would they use that gun in that situation? So it was probably more analytical to start with and a bit of fun. But I really enjoyed it. I probably went out to like 50, 50 listeners or something. Um, but over a period of time, over a period of a year or two, I, I built up quite a good following. Um, and it was only ever audio. You know, we didn't have Twitch. We didn't have YouTube. We didn't have uh, Twitter. We didn't have Reddit. We didn't have Facebook. We didn't have any of the things that we have now that we're able to use to popularize shows and get people to watch and listen. Um, and besides that, you had to listen. And it was all through Winamp. It was all very complex. Um, but things haven't really changed because if you think about it, we were using an IRC channel, which, mm. hello chat, by the way, <laughs> you're in an IRC channel right now. Uh, and we use Shoutcast, well, we use Twitch now for video. So it hasn't changed that much, but obviously as we've grown, the professionalism has grown as well. But yeah, those early days were, I look, I look back on them with a lot of fondness, but they were also massively unprofessional. So let me ask you this. Uh, in, in a Shoutcast setting on Winamp, it seems to me that it would be a very different kind of cast. You'd have to use a lot more descriptive terminology yes. sort of what's happening yes. on the map. Did you struggle with that transition from moving from an audio DJ cast to essentially live Twitch? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I think 2004 was the first time I did a LAN event. Um, and, and the first thing that put me off was just having a camera in front of me. I was kind of like, <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't want to look. I don't want to see these people. And you just, you know, I didn't understand where to look or, or how to do it. Um, but yeah, that was the biggest problem. There afterwards, it was more about um, understanding the flow of the broadcast more than anything else. Because when you're, as you rightly said, when you're on radio, you have to describe everything because that person can't see. So you're, you're painting a picture. So you have to be very descriptive. Now, I've often thought that actually one of the differences between some of the older shoutcasters, people like Joe Miller, uh, Lee Smith, D-Man, uh, Toss Pot, DJ Wheat, uh, some of the guys from the old TSN days, is because they've done radio first, it's actually easier for them to be less descriptive mm-hmm. or use more adjectives and, and have a wider vocabulary when they're commentating than it is perhaps for some of the newer guys coming in now who don't need to do that because obviously with the vision you you don't need to literally say what you see anymore you can let that flow um and yet still to this day a lot of commentators are determined to fill every second of air um with words and actually you you don't need to do that you can use dead air you can use pauses you can use throws you can use all sorts of skills um to make it flow better and and more enjoyable and if you listen to any real sport they'll do the same thing sometimes it's Mm -hmm. it's 30 seconds before someone says anything and you're you're kind of like are the commentators dead right Are, are they okay oh there they are great okay they're back um and and we just need to be you know, we just need to learn how to do better with that. Absolutely. I would um, say, so I would say, yeah, I did struggle a little bit to start with because I carried on doing it the same way. But after a while, you kind of go, hmm, kind of saying what they can see. I don't need to do that anymore. But I still use it occasionally, especially in CS, mm-hmm. um, because it helps with pace and it helps with excitement. Yeah. Well, and I think that if you if you watch soccer or for you football, 
Um, I think that they're they're good examples of commentators who are comfortable leaving dead air from time to time. Yep. Uh, when you watch like American football or American sports, yep. and I think a lot of North American fans maybe have trouble with this, they use dead air far less often. And I think that that often creates a frenetic pace that we see yep. out of North American casters versus uh, the British casters or the UK casters who some folks did ask a question about that on Reddit that we'll get to in a little while about why is it that British casters have been so gosh darn successful and I think that that might be something that has to play into it. Before Maybe. before we get to that though, here's a question I, I, when we talk about background um, that interests me and I know that you have two daughters and I don't want to get into any details about your personal life or family or any of that but what I do want to ask is someone who has raised women from a very young age um, to almost full grown at this point, if one of your daughters looked at you and said, Dad, I want to be a professional esports player. I want to insert game here, go pro. What would you say to them? Is Do you think that the scene has advanced to a point enough where you would be okay with that? Or do you think that the harassment would be too high for you to support it? Um, I mean, I would be okay with whatever she chose to do. I've, I've never really gone down the road of... Um, you know, preaching the gospel about esports and how cool it could be. Um, yeah, I think I would be okay with it in general, but in some ways, I hope that I would be able to give them some warning signs mm -hmm. of things that you know they need to watch out for. And and one of those things, unfortunately, about our uh, our various scenes, not just limited to one community either. Um, is, is our lack of respect for others, um, not not just women either, but you know, I think we're a very intolerant bunch at times, and yet other times I often look at us and think, well, we're very liberal, um, we're very we're very accepting, but it but it's so weird because I think again it's like in most communities and real life really the fact is we have a small minority that ruin it for the majority mm -hmm. and usually that minority are the loudest too so we think that there's a you know we think there's a lot there but actually it's usually just a few um you know morons basically <laughs> um and I you know I think you would have to make sure that you know they were aware of that and, and I do think that unfortunately women do get a a lot more stick than men do that's for sure but it's not limited mm -hmm. um to women it's it's you know uh there's different people in different positions of their lives some are young some are older um i get a lot of age jokes i mean it doesn't really bother me too much because i am what i am and hopefully if you're good enough you're going to get to my age as well um and you're all going to get old at some point mm -hmm. um but I, there's nothing I can do about it, and I don't really see the, the the funny side of it. But at the same time, it doesn't really bother me either. Um, but some people that don't have a thick skin don't last very long in video games or esports, for that matter. And I think that's very sad. It is. I, it's a that's a good perspective, and I really like that you bring up that it's not just a, a sexism thing all the time. But there's generally a lot of groups. Um, that can be afflicted by these idiots. So mm. it is what it is. Uh, that, so let's move to a little bit of a happier topic. Um, I want to go over a list of games that you have hosted or shoutcasted in your career, and I probably will miss some, but ones that our viewers will generally recognize. Um, Counter-Strike, Quake 3, Unreal Tournament, Call of Duty 2, Counter-Strike Source, World of Tanks, CSGO, League of Legends, Jesus. StarCraft 2, II, Dota 2, um, and those are the most prominent ones. There's a couple <laughs> of other games that I think uh, a lot of folks might not recognize. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a lot of different games to cover. And uh, in fact, what I want to do, just because some folks may not remember that you were actually a uh, shoutcaster at some point, is I want to play a little video. Uh, you may not be able to hear it, but this is the Falcon vs. Fnatic semifinal wow. in 2005 of Unreal Tournament, uh, in which you get to hear Paul doing some good old fashioned shoutcasting. 3 0 here as well. He's under the lightning gun. A couple of. Uh, shot combos coming in from Falcon, but he's decided to leave him alone, is he? Ah, oh, brilliant shot from from Lauke with a lightning gun, and that has pulled it back to 2-1. And, you know, it, Carmack's actually been right twice now. He even said, you know, the way scoring works is it's 1-0, 2-0. All right, so that was, I believe, with DJ Wheat in that uh, it was. particular final. It was, yeah. Uh, but it was. I think it's a fun example of just how how far a gaming and b sort of shoutcasting is has come but it's also very much the same and now you moved away from shoutcasting you, you live sort of in a specifically hosting realm at this point but yeah. as you navigated through all of those titles um 
what did what did you find most difficult about moving from game to game to game in that way? Um, that's a really good question. I, I mean, honestly, back in two thousand and four, five, I think we said to me. Like, the golden age of our gaming back then was that you went to the big tournaments. Right. And that was the reward you got for doing a, jo a good job. Or, you know, you worked a lot. And so, back then, the key tournaments would have been ESWC finals in France, uh, QuakeCon uh, in Dallas, WCG grand finals wherever they were in the world, usually in Korea early on, but many years later all over the world, and the CPL. And those were really the four that you wanted to go to and do. You know, they were the... the you know, the grand slams of the day, if you like. Um, and because those events were multifaceted, you you had to be able to do more than one game. It, it's not like today we have the International and it's Dota and that's it. Uh, or we have the LCS and it's League of Legends and that's it. Or we have a Major for Counter-Strike and that's it. Um, back in the day, those events would have 12 or 15 games sometimes that were going on. And because shoutcasting wasn't very um, refined, and we were still learning our way through streaming and video broadcasting, cameras, production, you know, we were learning all of that as we went along. And so what happened inevitably was that if you, if you got the chance to go and do these events, you only got them if you were good at many games. You couldn't be a, a one-game specialist. So whilst I started in Unreal Tournament, and I had the luxury of being able to do three different types of Unreal Tournament. I had TDM, I did CTF, and I did 1v1. Mm. And that's because I played the games. So I, I kind of understood the mechanics, uh, the aim, the prediction, the strategy, and everything else around that. And that transferred very easily to Quake. Mm. And I'd played Quake since 95. So I already had Quake and Unreal Tournament. They're first-person shooter games, so it was relatively easy to go and do pretty much any other FPS mm. that was in that same kind of mold with the same formats. Usually different guns, but that would be it. You'd learn weapon names, placement, and maps, and that would be about it. And then you could do it. And so you could probably learn that in a day and then be able to commentate on it reasonably well. Obviously, the complexity of the game is much deeper, but mm -hmm. as a play-by-play, -play, you're, you're literally trying to get the excitement of the kill across. So relatively easy early on. The difficult part for me probably came when I started moving um, to different genres. And when I started learning, you know, it, even Counter-Strike was a little tricky to start with because it's, it's an FPS, but it's a team-based FPS. There's a money system. The guns are very different. The maps are very different. The strategy is very different and so on. So that took a while. Um, I think other, outside of that, once you've learned, I think probably three or four genres, mm -hmm. you, can, you can usually apply that along the way. If you notice, it's quite interesting. I've never commentated on a MOBA, mm. ever. I've only ever hosted MOBAs. And I've never commentated on RTS, only ever hosted them. Mm. So in some weird kind of way, I've kind of understood where my limits are, and I've never gone past that. I think I've, if I'd commentated on Dota, people would hate me right now. If I'd commentated on StarCraft, probably, people would probably have hated me as well. Um, so I guess that's probably why I've been okay and I've been able to do lots of other games. Plus, back then, as I kind of alluded to, you needed to know lots of games. So Wheat said to me, if you want to do WCG, you're going to have to learn a couple of more games. You can't just go there and do a real tournament. It's just not realistic. And so I did. And I loved... You know, I love gaming. I love mm. playing games. Um, I love esports. I love the competitive side of it. I was very competitive uh, in my 20s and my 30s playing football, pool, uh, cricket, badminton, squash, anything, basically. I love competing. And I get that kind of kick out of playing video games as well. It's, whether it's a battle against the computer or a battle against another player or another team or a strategy or whatever, I love it. So it's actually very easy for me to go and learn another ma another game. Um and the same can be said when you host a game, you know, but it's, I mean, I know you want to talk about the preparation a little bit later anyway, so I'll touch on that mm -hmm. a little bit now and then maybe in more detail later. But generally, hosting is obviously different. You don't need to play the game in anywhere near the same depth as you do if you're commentating on it. But you do need to know the game. You do need to understand it. You need to understand the principles behind it, the strategy and what have you. But more than anything else, being a host is about delivering the experience and helping people guide them through the show. I'm not there to inform them about the game or about 
how cool something was or whatever. That's that's the job of the commentators and the analysts and the experts. Um, my job is to gel everything together and make it feel like you're watching a TV show or you know enjoying a stage show. Um, if I'm a host standing on the stage, so that's what I concentrate on. But that's not to say that I don't do an awful lot of prep because I do. So let me before we get to the prep, and that's going to be next up after this section. Yeah. Um, as somebody who's migrated through so many different games and communities, especially in an era where, like you said, we can now build entire tournaments and systems around a single game instead of multiple games. Yeah. Have you noticed any vast differences between these different game communities, or are they pretty much all connected by a similar thread? Um, I think every community is different. I think they're all very unique. Um... There's a lot of connections. You see a lot of similarities. I, I mean, I see um, similar questions about my role, for instance, mm. from the Dota community as I did from StarCraft four years ago when I first started doing StarCraft. Um, and they tend to be those kind of questions that I've just answered. Mm. You know, what, why would you hire someone that doesn't know anything about the game? Well, let me just put this out there. A, I, 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 it's not that I know nothing about the game, but I would never profess to being an expert on Dota 2. Uh, have I played a lot? No, I haven't played a lot. Have I watched a lot? Yeah, Hell yeah, I've watched an absolute ton of Dota over the last couple of years. Um, does that qualify me or make me the right person for the job? Probably not. Am I a good host? Yes. Can I deliver a professional show? Yes. Have I demonstrated that? Yes. Can I help you enjoy the show? Hopefully, yes. Um, and those are the reasons that I've been hired. And so I think asking me for things like, well, what's your MMR? Right. Uh, is, is kind of pointless in a way. And my MMR, by the way, is somewhere between ridiculously low and incredibly <laughs> pathetic. It's somewhere between that. It sort of bubbles up and down. Um, just for the record. So... Uh, let's talk about TI specifically, um, yeah. because I think this is this is a big question that I really wanted to give a chance to sort of uh, talk to you about, because I think it's unique in the way that you do your hosting. And I know that you take events very seriously. In fact, I remember a tweet not too long ago where um, you commented on the fact that you had turned down hosting jobs this year because you didn't yeah. feel that you had enough time to prepare for those events. Yeah. So what does your preparation for an event like TI look like? And is there a timeline that you follow while going through this? Um, I wouldn't say there's a specific timeline. I just need to feel... So I have to kind of roll this one away a little bit and explain why I prep as much as I prep, even though when I tell you about it, you'll probably think, well, he's already said he doesn't need to know that much to be a host. Why does he prep that much? And here's the reason. I identified very early on that one of the reasons that I was comfortable doing a host role on a TV show or standing in front of 10,000 people on a stage, mm -hmm. what I get my confidence from is feeling like I'm prepared. So the only way to do that, the only way to give me my confidence and not make me feel nervous or think that something's going to go wrong, because I am the world's worst when it comes to that stuff, trust me. Ten seconds out from the show start, I'm like, something has to be going wrong right now. What's going wrong? Can, can I hear the producer? Are we going live? Is, is it right? Is that, are the cameras on? Are the lights right? What's going on? I'm, I'm terrible. Um, but hopefully all inside my own head, never you know, kind of expressing that, just going... <laughs> I'm ready. Uh, but inside, it's going off. Uh, trust me, there's like a fireworks and a rave party going on all at the same time. Um, so the confidence that I get to go out there and do my job, because I'm not naturally very outgoing. It's like an alter ego, I think, that when I go out there. Mm -hmm. um, and I do get a massive buzz out of it. But the way, I, the way that that is sort of held together is by having the confidence to go out there and do that, right? And my confidence comes from feeling prepared. It's not about... Mm -hmm. Am I prepared? It's about feeling prepared. So, for example, a really good um, thing popped up recently. I've been working with Ben uh, Knoxville on um, statistics, and we've been talking about, you know, he's putting together these fantastic statistics, and I look at them, and then I go, yeah, but if what if I could change them to this, mm -hmm. because that gives me this, would I be able to do that? Yeah, I can do that for you. Brilliant. Okay. The level of statistics that I'm looking at right now, and it's not just about stats either, mm -hmm allows me to develop the storylines. Mm. So that's really where I start. My base preparation started last week, and it's more about general study. It's about watching VODs. It's about looking at teams. It's about understanding what makes them tick. It's about seeing their success and failures, any trends that I can see, both in wins, losses, 
how much time they might have spent in each map, how, how long they've taken to win, whether they've come back from behind, gold, that kind of stuff. It's all of that put in together in a melting pot. And then once I've got the information, and that might take a couple of weeks to put together, I'll have a spreadsheet. I've actually got the spreadsheet on my desktop right now. Uh, I've got Team Secret on here right now, which I've put together. I've put together some notes. There's an overview. It's a general kind of you know reminder because I'm old and addled uh, <laughs> of who the players are, who they've used to play for, their dates of birth, how much money they've won in all time. And because it's TI, and I want to focus on TI as, a, as an entity of its own, I think it's really interesting in the fifth year now that we've now got some history. Um, we've got four previous ones, and it's interesting to look at them and think, okay, so Puppy has played in all previous four. He's now going to play in the fifth one in a row. How many players have done that? It'd be interesting to find that out. So I will go to Knoxville and go, right, find me all the players in this tournament that have played in all five. I want a list of them because that's interesting to me. Right. And I want to see then how successful those people have been. So Puppy, I can instantly see, okay, he's won one, he's been second mm -hmm. twice, and he's been seventh and eighth for the fourth one. So he's always reached the quarterfinal, regardless of what team he's in. Great stat to have. So if if that happens again with Secret, and it, let's face it, it should, right. if they get to the quarterfinals, he's carried on that record of being mm -hmm. potentially the only player that's made the top eight in all five TIs. Now, what a great story that is. Right. That's a story in its own right. And I've found that within, you know, I'm giving you a very simple example. Anyone could have found that one. Mm -hmm. But it's an example of stats that lead to storylines. And that's what I'm most interested about when I come to prepare. So the initial part is collection of stats and very boring. And I like stats, so it's okay for me. Looking at their previous events, looking everything since the last international. Can we see a trend? Have they gone on and won three in a row, four in a row, five in a row? Who's beaten them that they might be placed against on the tree? Have they got a good record against anyone? Have they got a losing record against anyone? Losing stats are just as important as winning ones. And from there, once I feel confident that I understand who the team are, what their makeup is, how they play, their style, who leads, who doesn't lead, who stands out, who's playing well, who's not playing well... Beyond all of that, it's about the storylines that I can then pull into the show and throw at the analysts or the experts. Um, and then hopefully them developing on that and, and bringing out something from that. It's a leader, if, if nothing else. Yeah, so it sounds like you're using all these stats in this preparation not so much to sort of say, hey, look, I know Dota 2, but more to really create something that I think lacks in esports in general, and that is storylines and meaningful connections between fans and events. Because I think that that's the th biggest yep. problem we have, is if you watch the Super Bowl or, or the World Cup or any sort of major event, um, they have these little storyline snippets that sort of make us fall in love with players or teams, and we don't get that in esports. So I do yep. think, I, I definitely appreciate that um, when we see a host pull those in. So it's definitely definitely really need to see and on a side note guys um i'll be at ti doing gorilla interviews on the outside and knoxville will be sitting down with me there um to chat a little bit about stats for the event preparation and all that stuff so uh look for those as um you know they'll be hosted they'll be hosted as much as we possibly can get them up there now um you're you are about to host what and, and you agreed with this but based on the prize pool we'll say for all of those acolytes of other games out there the biggest esport events in history i mean the prize pool has already crested 15 million uh with the announcements that have been made recently about the aegis the T immortal coming out this week and some other things it's it's easy to believe that we'll break 17 million if not more um what are you most excited about going into this event uh it's tough, isn't it? Because when you look at the money, you, you think, okay, this this is going to be mm -hmm. the biggest esports tournament of all time. Mm -hmm. And then I I sort of have to pinch myself a little bit and think, wow, I'm actually going to host that. That's <laughs> that's amazing. Um, so from a personal point of view, it's very it's very cool for me. It's an event I always wanted to do. I even back in the day, it wasn't you know that I was a big Dota fan mm -hmm. back in the day. It was more that. As a host and as a commentator, you want to go to the biggest events on the planet. And right. when you watched the first two internationals, you could see that actually these are going to be special, and people are going to look back on these as being, you know, fantastic events. Um, and here we are in 2015 at the fifth one, and you know, I get to host it. So I'm thrilled from that point of view. It's it's a bucket list moment, if you like, for That's me. Awesome. Um, and in terms of the money, I want to say this: it's it's fabulous. It really is fabulous that we have that amount of money for a tournament. 
that it puts esports up there with pretty much anything. I think there's only like five or six things in the world of sport mm -hmm. that pay more more prize money for a single event. I mean, yeah. this, this amount of money is more than an NFL winner would get. It's more than an FA Cup winner gets. Uh, last year, anyway. Uh, I forget the list. It's more than you know most golf tournaments pay out. It's more than most tennis tournaments pay out. There's like five or six. Look it up. There's like five or six tournaments in the world that pay more prize money than the international. So from that point of view, we have well and truly arrived on the mainstream screens. And that's great, because that's all I ever wanted for esports. I wanted it to be out there and accepted as a genuine thing, you know, a genuine competition. And I don't care if people call it a sport or not. I really don't. It's a competition. It's competitive. And it's a fabulous world if you, if you watch it and you enjoy it. So that's great. And it helps that. It does. But it's not the be-all and end-all about it. I mean, I, I want it to be clear that these are great players. They're great teams. And they're going to a great event. And it will be greatly produced and everyone will enjoy it. But let's not get too wrapped up in the prize money. It is an amazing amount of money. It's fantastic. It's life-changing and that's fabulous. But let's not, let's not forget about the fact that it's actually about the competition, about the game that you guys love. Absolutely. And I think that a lot of folks get caught up in the prize pool because it, yeah, it draws so. attention from non-Dota enthusiasts. It, it draws attention from ESPN. It draws attention from Fox Sports to say, what's going on? And, and by the way, guys, that article, if you want to find it, dotablast.com uh, published a comparison uh, a couple of days ago that compares Dota's oh. prize pool to the top 10 uh, traditional sports. So, And that's everything from the Super Bowl to the World uh, Cricket World Cup. Um, so you can go check that out on Dota Blast. It is a pretty good article. But I think it draws attention from outside groups, and that sort of makes us exciting because yep. it means, oh, we get exposure. And actually, uh, you spoke with PC Gamer before TI4. And the PC Gamer interview, they asked you uh, specifically, they said, what's your feeling about the vast amount of money in Dota 2 this year? What are the ramifications, not just to Dota, but for esports in general? And your answer was, I think we have to wait another year before we figure out what it does to the landscape. But overall, it's a good thing. It's a sea change in how tournaments can fund themselves because the majority of money has come from us. It'd be interesting to see how that falls. A yep. year later, um, almost exactly, do you have any thoughts on that or is it sort of the same situation? Um, yeah, it is. Frustratingly, it's a little bit similar. I was hoping by now that other companies would have figured that this is a great way of tapping into the community without pissing the community off and actually giving them value for money for something that they can have, whether it's items or you know special builds or clothing or whatever it might be. It's a fabulous way to fund the tournament, reward the esports superstars that we all love to see playing, give us the tournament that we want, make it more mainstream acceptable and noticeable. It does so many good things that I'm surprised more haven't done it. I suppose in a way, you know, a year on, many tournaments now are paying out more prize money than ever before, but they're doing it on their own merits. They're not necessarily using crowdfunding outside of Dota 2. Um, I think the only other one would be Counter-Strike um, mm -hmm. with the skins, and even then it's sort of capped, and they're doing four majors, and maybe Dota does that. and you know, So in a weird sort of way... It's almost a victim of its own success in many ways, the international, because it's this one-off kind of you know giant thing, and it's fabulous. Mm. Um, it may have put others off, mm. I suppose, which is a bit weird. I would have expected other companies by now to have, have looked at this and gone, that's a really smart way of, of doing this. Even if it's just a one-off, the only other company I can think of that have taken advantage of it was Smite. Mm -hmm. where they went from, I think, one pound, 1 1.4 million to 2.6 million right. um, for their world finals. And, you know, it's sat there right now in the list of all of the most prize money pools that have ever paid out. I think it's fourth. And the right. only things ahead of it are the internationals. Right. So <laughs> well done to them. Well done. What a great community of a, of a game that not many people often consider as being right up there with the best esports. So yeah. no, it can be done. It's interesting. I actually heard a story, and I won't use names, of an executive from a very large esports uh, game publisher stopping someone at an event and going, so explain to me crowdfunding and why it's a good thing. And I think that that's something that is definitely an avenue to be explored, especially because when it's $15 million, the sponsors flock, right? Because they want to yep. be involved with whatever is happening that yep. is incredibly so popular and shows how much it can motivate um, fans. Now, in the same interview with PC Gamer, um, you made a comment and said, if you look at sports on TV right now, there's a lot of presenters that have come from professional TV backgrounds. We're on that road. And I suppose my fear as an esports person is that we either step up or we make way for the pros. Is the solutions 
is the solution to have studios invest in training their staff, invest in professional development, or do you foresee replacement <coughs> happening in the future? Um, you know, honestly, I think that comment was born out of the frustration of not seeing enough come through. Hmm. Um, I think a year on, we, we, we do have more hosts, we do have more commentators, they are better, they are getting better. But I'm still worried. I'm still worried that, you know, when this finally does break into mainstream, I don't think mainstream TV companies will, will necessarily try and change it, perhaps the way the CGS did mm. um, seven or eight years ago. I think we can we can be safe now that our model of delivering esports and making it enjoyable for crowds is delivering so many eyeballs now that actually they'll just come to us and, and they'll want to produce it or take the coverage or whatever and put it on their shows. But I still hear a lot of criticism from people that come from TV backgrounds that they're not entirely sure about all of the commentators or all of the hosts within esports shows that they watch. Um, and it's because they're looking at it from a professional you know, TV background. That said, I think there's somewhere for all of the content that we produce, whether it's, you know, off the wall, wacky, over 18, swearingy type shows, mm -hmm. that, that's great. And I think Twitch does a fantastic job of hosting those. YouTube does the same. Uh, MLG, the same. So I think that's fine. But mainstream TV wants something different. They want professional, broadcast ready shows. Um, and so it's more aimed at that than anything else. If we, you know, if we want to carry on being, you know, I'm an esports person. I might not be specifically a Dota guy or a StarCraft guy or a Counter Strike guy, but I'm an esports guy. I love esports. I love all the games within esports. I'm very passionate about it. I will happily sit on the train or plane or whatever with whoever and explain exactly what I do. I'm not. I'm not ashamed of it. I don't care that they think it's a bit geeky or a bit nerdy. I think it's quite cool these days to be a nerd or a geek. Um, I'm more than happy to, you know, if I win one guy round out of a year of sitting next to people on a plane, then happy days, right? We've, we've got an extra, an extra viewer. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's great. That's, that's who we need to be. But I would be very upset if someone who wasn't, someone who wasn't an eSport, they come for me, uh, wasn't an eSports fan or you know wasn't in the industry or wasn't in the game came along and, and took that job because I know for a fact they would do a great job as a host or as a commentator right. but they might not have the passion for it well and I and, think and, and I that think... would be disappointing but it, but it will happen if we don't step up it partly it's why I wrote the book right okay so to help to put something back to help make esports yeah. personality survive because I think a good example of this is everyone's excited about uh I think it's Casey Atchison is how you say her name. She'll be at TI from what I understand. She tweeted it out. Yeah. Um, she works in the Seattle area, is a newscaster, does a lot of interviews, and she's phenomenal. She does her yeah, job very, very yeah. well. But that's a good example of even the community is saying, yes, bring Casey back. Mm -hmm. But in reality, Casey didn't sort of come up through esports. She just yep. does her research very well. And that, yep. I think, is something that could happen to yep. a lot of esports and, jobs. And trust the me, there are thousands of Casey's out mm -hmm. there. No disrespect to Casey, she does a great job. And what I thought was great about her the first year, she she soaked herself in the tournament, yes. the players, the team. She she might not you know, know every intricate detail and every single piece of how Dota works, mm -hmm. but she definitely threw herself in. Um, and that came across in her interviews. But more than anything else, it's because she knows how to do that role. Yep. And that's a TV role. And there are thousands of those type of people out there waiting, mm -hmm. just ready to come in if they can uh, and, do it, and do a similar job. So, you know, we just need to be careful. I, I want to try and I'm a little bit selfish. I want to kind of just keep all the esports stuff to the esports people. <laughs> keep it to people who've been struggling and like paying their bills <laughs> yeah. with peanut butter. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I love seeing, I mean, Capitalist is a great example of someone mm -hmm. that, you know, he worked hard, he kept at it, he kept improving, he asked people for advice, uh, took every opportunity he could get when he got given it, and ran with it, did the best job he could possibly do, spoke to the right people. Yes, it's about networking, what a shock. <laughs> but you have to have the innate talent, you have to have the innate ability to go and do it, and you have to have some balls to go and stand in front of people and, and deliver a great show. And, and he's done that, and look at him a year on, mm -hmm. you know, good well done to the guy and there's plenty of other stories like that not just in dota but in other games too so speaking of which since and this by the way is complete happenstance that uh 
Paul's giving me all these chances to get plugs in. But at the event in TI, uh, Capitalist and I have scheduled a sit down to discuss going from driving a forklift to casting the biggest game in esports history. So sure it's a great that. story. It's a great story. So he, he's actually <laughs> agreed it. to sit down with me. Uh, maybe we'll get a beer while we talk about it uh, and do a taping to sort of talk about this, how he literally <laughs> was a longshoreman or a stevedore, if you will, and, yeah. and is now. You, you should do the interview on, on a forklift. On a forklift. So he's while driving around the car park. So he's I'm sure we can find one. It would be pretty phenomenal um so that, so check that out guys uh one more question before we move to the uh reddit stuff and we had a lot of messages i put a reddit post up this morning and we got a ton of responses uh questions oh, for you but um in an interview two years ago with gozu gamers uh you said you like ti3 as a tournament on its own merit but you yeah. don't but you don't think it serves the community as well as wcs does do you still believe that a league format would be better for dota 2 or do you think the major system will suffice yeah, I'm I'm a firm believer. I'm just a league fan. I mean, I love mm. I love the individuality of one tournament. I I loved it back in the day when we did WCG Grand Finals. Um, still to this day, one of my favourite tournaments is WCG 2005 in Singapore. Um, I love those kind of you know one-off, unique kind of thing. They're brilliant. But as a community thing, and especially for a player, having one giant tournament every year that that gives out the majority of the money makes the the rest of the year very difficult to kind of live with you're you're almost living month to month in the hope that your 11 months of the year can come together at the right time of the year you know it's a bit like think of it like this if you look at the amount of money that puppy won at ti1 right he won more money last year for finishing seventh and eighth Hmm. so Hmm. which one's got more value well arguably it was a harder tournament last year there were better players better teams they're more prepared they're more professional they have more training the more strategy blah 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 i accept that and it's a very you know simplistic way of looking at it but still the money is there um does he i don't know but does he feel that oh, he kind of looks back on tier one and goes god i wish that was 15 million yeah could have had seven and a half million between us that year damn it's a shame. But could, um, could, could they have won had the scene been a statue? I, I know, I, I know. And so that those is are the fun the, of questions. Of course, I know. And it is, <laughs> I'm having a little bit of fun with it. Um, so, yeah, I stand by my point in the sense that I, I prefer it to be spread out a bit more just to make the scene a little bit more stable. I think we'll inevitably, we'll see at the end of, you know, I don't want to get too far ahead because I want to enjoy the tournament. I want everyone else to enjoy it. But I'm sure that once TI5 finishes, Within a few days, we'll start seeing the usual post that we've seen for the last two years, which is this team breaks up, these players are leaving, these teams are forming another team, this team's going over here, this team's doing that, this team's not coming back, this team's retired. We'll have exactly the same thing, and we'll have that four weeks of, uh, well, players leaving dank memes. Right. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the analyst's favorite time in, in soccer and football <laughs> and everywhere else. So I, I don't, you know, it, writing my shows during that period are a piece of cake. Now, guys, we do have to take a quick, set, a quick break, 30 seconds, uh, for a commercial from our sponsors. And when we come back, we have Reddit questions and questions from you, the viewers, uh, to give to the man who will be hosting the biggest esports event in history. So stick around. Razer Comms is a free all-in-one communication tool that allows you to stay in touch with friends both in and out of the game. With features such as friendless, groups, mobile SMS forwarding, and call notifications, Razer Comms is a communication solution for the dedicated gamer. Razer Comms minimal in-game overlay has a panel that grabs all your messages and lets you see who is speaking in a voice call without interrupting your game. Now I'll always know who's breathing into the mic. It's always me. By pairing Razer Comms mobile with your PC, your friends can call you, no matter where you are. All right, and welcome back. We are here with Paul Red Eye Challoner. Challoner, I want to get that flow right. Um, who's joining us <laughs> on the show job. today? Thank that you. Was fun. I yeah, try was my good. best. I try. That was uh, for Jeff, by the way. If Jeff's watching, <laughs> uh, hopefully, I don't know. Jeff, are you there? Are you there, Jeff? It's me. It probably Tom. is. Um, that said, guys, we're here to talk about TI5, and actually, we opened up the forums today. I got on a bunch of different forums and posted, give me questions to ask Red Eye. I want you, the community, to get to know him better because we're going to be spending a lot of time with him over the next couple of weeks. So let's start out with this one. Bracer Crane asked, why is the UK so prevalent in hosting, casting, and organizing events? Um, while it seems there are no next-to-nil professional players. In Dota 2 alone, we've got 2GD, OD Pixel, Shane, PFLAX, Sujoy, and Red Eye taking part in casting organizing and hosting 
and it's in, in international specifically, and it's qualifiers, while there were zero UK players taking part in the competition. So this is two parts. Why do you think we have so many, so much talent and so little player base? And why do you think that you guys have such a large representation among the larger grouping of uh, casting and talent? Uh, so let's answer the talent one first, because that's probably easier for me. Um, I think the easiest answer is that we are blessed to be born in England. Uh, or Britain, and given the Queen's English to speak, and fortunately, or whatever, most of the world seems to like our language or our accents or something. I don't know, um, but I think that's that's mainly to do with why so many British people succeed um, in the talent side of things in terms of broadcasting. I, I think there's also an element of history involved as well. Um, myself, uh, D-Man, uh, Tosspot, um, Joe Miller. Um, Borderline Toby one, we class him as British. It's thin line, but you know we'll class him as British for now. Uh, bear with me; he's got the same Queen. It's all good, um, and too good as well. We're all old school. We're all very old school. You know, we're pre two thousand and five, which is, um, you know, in real world terms, is probably forty years ago, uh, considering that we have probably four years in every esports year because we change so fast. So we were all players back then and we've all come from being players or playing at a decent level or with the right people or whatever and have kind of fallen into this as we've got older especially me um so i think that's partly to do with it as well but I, generally i do believe it's a, it's a language luck thing um as to why we're all of our players are absolutely terrible in britain um Honestly, it drives me mad. We used to be pretty good at games back in the day. I remember back in 2003, four, we, we had some decent players, decent teams. We did all right in Quake. We did all right in Unreal Razor Tournament. Is a free uh, even Too Good was quite good at playing games at one point. Um, won a few World of Warcraft tournaments, although anyone could do that, right? Uh, sorry, James. Um, he was pretty good at Quake, though, back in the day. When, we were, when I was commentating on him, he was very good at Quake. Probably the easily the best, best, best British player uh, we had. Um, but it just seems like as the world has kind of evolved and moved on and everyone else has kind of got hooked on esports, the UK public really haven't. And mm. I don't know why that is. We just we just haven't <laughs> in general. I'm, and I am very much generalizing right now. Um, but it wasn't all that long ago. We were, we were pretty good. You know, I remember the Birmingham Salvo, uh, a guy called Rattlesnake in Counter-Strike Source, winning world championships, taking a million dollars. Um, you know, we we were we were pretty good, and then over the last five years we've been rubbish. Hmm. Um, but I think a mixture of things, you know, environment, country, kind of things that we're into. We have a lot more things to do for some reason. There's there's so many other things that you can go and do in your life, um, and we just get distracted easily, I guess. And we're off doing other stuff. We so, mean, so the moral uh, of the men. story is beaches uh, uk players like to swim so they don't work and <laughs> and if north america if my country had re had stayed a part of the queen's domain yes, you too I, would I would have dominated the talent arena that's a uh, who would but you thought? would never have had any good dota players so it's a it's a bit of a tr yeah. it's a trade it's a wash <laughs> that's good um all right so on to the next question uh <laughs> dendelian <laughs> asks he said you've been in the scene for a long time now and you've seen yes. games come and go and with that, uh, he also has various thoughts on some of these games have been handled by their devs. So, how do you feel about the way Dota 2 has been handled by Valve compared to, say, StarCraft 2? That's a really cool question, because I've actually been asked that the other way around by StarCraft fans. Hmm. And they're always... So, here's the, here's the crux of it all, alright? And I do have... Um, good experience of lots of games and communities as well, so hmm. I've kind of got a bit of an eye on this one. This is purely my own view, okay? I think that every single community thinks that the other communities are better, or their developers are better, or they've got better ideas, or they support better, or they provide better updates, or they're better with their community. Every single community thinks their community sucks for those things, and actually it doesn't. It's because we're all stuck in a bubble. Um, and rightly so, because you know, most people latch onto one game, um, and aren't, I'm probably not the norm. I'm, you know, I'm an esports geek. I love lots of esports. Most people like one game in particular, and because you're stuck in that bubble, you don't always see the detail of what's going on in other games. So, 
Asking it the other way round, StarCraft fans were like, it's so unfair, they've got crowdfunding, and Valve listen to everything they ever say, and Valve always implements all the things that the community want, and they listen to all the Reddit threads and reply to every comment on Reddit, it, and it's just like, guys, really? That's Not only is that ridiculous, because if you ask any Dota person, they will go, wait, who? <laughs> right. No, no, that, that's complete rubbish. <laughs> You've got Blizzard, they're on every Reddit thread, they listen to every comment, they implement things in the game, you get regular updates. So, it, it's always the same the other way, the grass is always greener, but trust me, be happy with what you've got right now. <laughs> nice. So, and I, I do notice that a lot, and I think you're, it's funny too, because when I talk to people who play other esports, it's like, well, Valve listens, and I go, I don't hear from Valve, but once a year when they give me a compendium to spend money on. Um, so it's a, it's a unique perspective. So let's move into uh, the lightning round of Reddit questions. I don't want to keep you all night long, so I'll give you sure. a couple. And uh, let's just get your a couple short answers on this one. So uh, first off, Reddit overwhelmingly wants to know, can you spill any beans on the details about the TI format? Because a lot of us are still completely in the dark. No. All right. I figured that'd be a fast question, so I'm sorry <laughs> about that one. <laughs> All right, number two, uh, Knoxville, a man that you are familiar with, wants yes. me to ask, do you prefer gin or whiskey? Uh, neither. Hmm. Um, I, I think I think along the line somewhere in my family history, I must have Mexican blood because I love tequila. Te really? Yeah, I'm a real te I love tequila. It has like, to be gold, though. Like at least you're a gold. tequila sipper kind of, kind of guy? I I, I throw them down my throat. Wow. <laughs> All right. So anyone that's TI, if you want any information on anything, tequila. Tequila. All right, I can. I will take that deal. Tequila. <laughs> we, we're gonna have a. Uh, we're gonna have nightcap with toffees and interview. While Brilliant. I, shots, I like that. I nightcap with toffees. Brilliant. I think it'll be fun. We'll do it at a pub. Yeah. All right. Um, right now, if you had a thousand pounds, to, if you had to bet a thousand pounds on which team you think will win TI, which team you think it'll be? Oh God! Um, can I do heart and head? Can I do five hundred dollars in each? I'll let you do five hundred. Sure, I'll let you do heart and head. Right. But then you have to okay. answer my next question. All right, God. Uh, so I would put five hundred on secret with the heart, five hundred on Vici with the head. Interesting. So no, no EG in there, huh? I think EG are the next one is obviously in. Gotcha. Secretly, don't tell anyone. No one's watching or listening right now. Nice, nice. I'll, I'll, I'll let them know when I visit the training camp this week. No one uh, saw that, right? No, nobody saw that. Okay, it's completely good. off the record. Right. Here's the next question that you that you agreed to answer, and that is, if you had to bet the same thousand pounds on who loses TI and gets last place, oh, who God. would you say? Oh, God, that's a horrible question. A horrible question. Whatever I say now, they're going to be like, we don't like <laughs> right. He said we finished last. This is Knoxville's question, so you can blame um, him for this one. It's Knoxville. Ben, what are you doing to me already? Uh, that drink I promised you, Ben, is now off the table. <laughs> um, oh, God. It could be really cruel. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say this because I know that he'll hate me for saying it, but I know he'll also forgive me, Navi. All right, fair enough, fair enough. He will, they will forgive. That's you a bit of a cop out, but yeah, I don't they're know. They're so kind. They're so kind. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, you've been playing a lot of games for a very long time. Uh, Lur wants to know which game or game version was and is of all the games you've ever hosted your personal favorite. Um, like if you had to sit down at a computer and say, "I've got an hour to play video games," which one would yeah. you fire up? Uh, if it's if it's lately Counter Strike, okay. because Global Offensive is really offensive to my time. Mm. Um, all time, I would probably pick. I'd probably either pick Elite on the BBC B, Championship Manager on the Amiga, or. Goldeneye in the N64. I like Goldeneye. Can't be beaten with a golden gun, and I will take that challenge anywhere. Paintball, paintball, golden gun only. Oh, what a so game. much fun. So much fun. All right, uh, <laughs> here are two questions that I think are good for background stuff, and uh, Lineage asks just briefly, what is behind the scenes like for talent? We know that players do scrims, and they prep, and they have like yep. their own practice rooms. What does your time between being on stage look like? Uh, depends greatly on on different events. I mean, some events we we can 
we've got lots of area so we get a green room or we we have a room somewhere else where we can watch all the matches and we can socialize and be a bit fun and have some you know sort of let our hair down in a, a fairly safe environment it's like a crish uh, sorry a crish a crash a crash for older people imagine you know the five-year-olds when you throw them in there when you go and do your shopping it's like that kind of place but for adults gotcha. although we probably don't act like adults in there um that's a, that's at some of the better tournaments um when we go to other tournaments where it's very busy and maybe it's one of those ones where you're it's like it, an event within an event it's mm-hmm. much harder because you actually have to sort of navigate through massive crowds to get to a different place and what have you um and whilst i have no problem you know signing stuff or stopping for photos or whatever when you're actually trying to work it it is actually quite difficult because you know trying to get somewhere and you've only got say five minutes between a segment and you've got to find a toilet and, and then you've got to come back by the time you've got just outside of the the stage you've right. literally got to come back and you're still your bladder's still full um so that can be a bit awkward um i love when people do proper signing sessions mm. esl were very good at doing that um same at gfinity right now so if we if you have a designated signing area and you get say right you've got to go here and you've got to stand here for an hour mm-hmm. and sign stuff i'm absolutely fine with that. i love that because it allows me to talk to people sign stuff stand for photos do whatever they want basically um for that hour and then once it's up i've i've got a job to go and do so you know i, I think that's much easier okay. um, but behind the scenes is it's fairly boring you know don't it's not glamorous at all it's very bad back there. it's dusty it's it's normally smelly and loud and leery and there's stuff going on everywhere and you're i'm, I'm literally walking around going please don't damage the suit please i don't want any dust on me and for god's sake don't touch my face or come near me because i don't want to have to go and put more makeup on um it's it's not glamorous not really fair um phage guy who is actually uh, the founder of the standard deviant stat crew i know knoxville works with them and some mm. other people um he messaged me and he said no other esport has a resource like dat dota and he, and i know from our conversation earlier we talked about your mm. stats and how you use it um do you how does having resources like even Knoxville or the websites that he uses yeah. make uh, affect your preparation versus maybe other esports that you cover? It's a great question. Um, so in the past, I would have to go and do it myself. Mm-hmm. So I have a database here on a PC in the other room, mm-hmm. which basically has every result of a 1v1 tournament from 1995 to about 2007 wow. and i used to keep that I, I can write basic php and sql so I, I would literally update that after every event uh i would yeah scramble all over the internet to try and find these results of quake and hexen and doom and whatever it was that was going on in the day and i kept that going because i was doing more and more of those kind of tournaments yeah. quake Unreal tournament uh painkiller doom whatever it was and so from there, I was able to do that. Later on, of course, it became much harder. Um, 2009, 10 onwards, much harder because we didn't quite have that Dota or you know any of the other sites that are out there for other games, and you had to kind of do it yourself. So it was a bit hit and miss at times. So I'm massively thankful for sites like that. Massively thankful for having people like Knoxville around as well, and Bruno before him too was fabulously helpful. And Nahaz has also been amazing um, in previous events that I've worked on on Dota as well. Um, and whilst you know that Dota might sort of you know be championing the stats and saying no one else has that, uh, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that because there are some other sites that do a fabulous job for their specific game. I, don't get me wrong, that Dota is amazing and I love it for finding stats, uh, and you can pretty much find it whatever you want. Mm-hmm. But there are other sites out there, Eligulac.com, Check it out; it does all the StarCraft stuff, and they are brilliant at what they do. Um, the Liquid guys, both. Liquid Dota and Liquipedia, which it started off being a brew war, um, not just stats but stories and, and detail and everything. I've used that for, for many years now for StarCraft 2 and brew war. Um, there's also Counter Strike on Liquid now. So there's there's a number of sites out there called Stats springs to mind as well if you're into your Call of Duty on the Xbox, and they're all fabulous because. As a presenter or a host or a commentator, those are the resources that you need to be able to do your bro- job properly and prepare properly for an event. Mm-hmm. So I, anytime those guys want to shout out a tweet, a retweet, it's the least I can do for them because for me, it's like free info that I you know, don't have to make up myself or yeah. find out from anywhere else. It's all in one place. What I would say is this, as great as it is having... Uh, Bruno, Nahaz, or in this occasion, Knoxville. I've said this to Ben as well, so he won't be offended. I still have to do it myself. 
I still have to go to the site, filter things out, find out the stats that I want, because it's part of my routine. I'm a bit old in that way, a bit old and set me ways, a bit infirm, got slippers, got a bit of a blanket and a walking stick. I've, I need to be able to do it myself because then it goes in. Mm. We all learn in different ways. Some learn by watching, some by, learn by doing, mm. some learn by listening. Um, I, I actually have to do, and then it, it soaks in. If, if Knox, if I gave him a list of stuff I wanted, he'd go and do it. Mm. And then he'd send it to me and it'd be fabulous. Right. And I'd read it and go, hmm, yep, none of that went in. Brilliant. Right. Didn't get anything. I'm going to have to do that myself now. And if, So if I do it, if I physically go and find the stuff it soaks in much better. So it's great to have somebody help guide you to the stuff that you yeah. need, but then you have to sort of assimilate it yourself. Yeah. Um, as we wrap this up, a lot of folks brought this up and I want to know if you care to address it or if you just have no interest whatsoever. Um, and that is the ask me anything post that two GD put up specifically about you uh, a couple of weeks ago. Did you have a chance to read that? I didn't. So, uh, Oh, is it, uh, what was the, he, remind me of the he comment. He basically says that you're a fantastic host, but he'd rather see yeah. Shiva at this event because he finds you to be incredibly narcissistic, um, and, you ha and had to fight to, he, he, he said, I was the same way I had to bring myself back to earth. So I understand, yeah. but I hope he reads this and thinks I'm a massive dick for saying it. Um, then maybe <laughs> thinks about why, uh, I said this in an open AMA. So he and then he, he literally put in quotations at the end. And yes, I am a massive dick for saying this. Sorry, Paul. Yeah. Um, but a lot of folks want to know, did you read that? Do you have a response to it? Uh, I, d I didn't read it initially, but someone pointed out to me. I think someone tweeted at me. So I did. I did read it. Um, I mean, he's right. Um, you know, this is, we're all a bit narcissistic. We have to be. It's part of the talent thing. Um, am I massively narcissistic? No, absolutely not. Um, we had a conversation. I actually sent him a Skype message and mm. said, um, what I said to him, uh, there we go. I don't know. We had a conversation about it anyway. And he said, uh, you are a bit narcissistic, Paul. Ha ha. I said, yeah, a bit sure. We all are. And he says, yeah. And he says, I know. Anyway, good. The things are going well for you. So, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a bit. It's a bit Jamesy um, because he's just as big a narcissist as I am, and, and he'll admit that. And I'm a dick for saying it too. Um, but at the end of the day, I love James because I sort of feel like he's one of us as well. He's one of the old school. He's been around the block. He's played played at the highest levels. Uh, I've I've loved commentating on some of his gaming in the past. I think he's a terrific competitor. Uh, he's got a great brain on him. Mm -hmm. um, comes up with some amazing ideas as well. And sometimes he can be a bit a bit controversial and that's that's james you know we wouldn't we wouldn't enjoy the stuff that he does if he wasn't um but go back to 2007 and the pair of us were doing a, a show together uh on sky on mm. tv so you know i have a massive amount of respect for him and what he's done in the esports and anyone that says or compares the two of us as hosts is is pointless because we're very different and uh, we bring different things to the show and there's room for both of us to do those things. Um, it just depends on the style of show. You know, one year it might be, uh, it wants to be really controversial and edgy, and that's great. James does that far better than I could ever do it. Um, and he also has a lot more fun on camera. He's less worried about the risks, I think. I'm, right. I'm a bit more reserved, perhaps, and a bit more um, safer, maybe. I don't know. But we're neither of us are less professional than each other. So... Uh, I think it just depends whatever the producer wants and whoever's doing the show, what they want out of the show. Now, and I and I could be wrong here, and you may correct me, is keep in mind, I come from a theater and an acting background. Sure. I've been to thousands of auditions. I've done, a, you know, been through the ropes. And I think that narcissism often is is called narcissism, but it, narcissism, but is also sort of like a defensive barrier because of the amount of difficulty, trolling, rejection that sort of comes yeah. in the early stages that you have to really believe that you're great at what you do or you won't make it through some of that. Do you think that that's true in esports, or is that just something that's unique to the acting world? No, I think there's an element of that. I mean, I, I've, I've... It's very difficult for me to explain this without mm. sounding narcissistic, I guess. But So I understand I must be quite good at hosting. Okay, let me just say that, and then hopefully that doesn't come across too arrogant. But, uh, but and I only, re only realise that, not because I'm narcissistic, but because... Mm. I'm chosen for big events and I got hired and I've done lots of other stuff around the world. So that's kind of what tells me I'm good at what I do. Mm -hmm. 
but don't for a second think I go home and go, I'm fabulous, I'm brilliant, I'm Alan Partridge, I can do anything in the world, I can go and host any esports event, TI5, no problem. It's more like I come home and go, shit, what if they find out? What if they find out I'm actually not very good? Right. Done a good job of covering it up so far, but hopefully nobody notices that I spilled my words or I dropped that box on the screen or I talked about something <laughs> I shouldn't have done or, you know, I mean, holy crap, I... I I worry all the time that it all falls apart tomorrow. I'm very insecure, actually, mm. um, about it. And uh, I'm getting older as well, so there's a little bit of an age thing in my head of, um, you know, how long can I do this for? It's a very young person's industry, and I like that. But at the same time, it's uh, how appropriate is it having a, a, a mid-40s guy on a show? Mm. I don't know. Um Obviously, it's not an issue right now, but I'm sure in a few years it will be. So, what do I do then? Do I change my career? Do I, you know, what do I do? So, I've had a lot of these sort of insecurities about the role and about esports. And I'm honestly, I'm not very outgoing. Um, I know I might seem like that when I'm on camera, but I'm not. Um, and it does feel like a bit of an alter ego for me. But it's it's helped me be more open, I guess, so uh, by doing the role. While you're on the topic about that sort of how long does it last? Um, that actually segues way well into my last question. Uh, in 2012, you did an interview with JP. Um, it was like three hours long. I appreciate <laughs> you guys making it so long and winding because I got to spend my afternoon listening to that yesterday. Uh, <laughs> Poor <but> you. <laughs> there was a lot of long. There's a lot of long interviews. Mm. Um, but I will say this: you said during the interview that until esports is massive and widely accepted, you felt a sense of responsibility to, in your own words, see it through to the end. Do you feel that it has begun to hit that point where you can sort of wash your hands and be like esports has has grown, or do you think you're going to be in it for a while longer? Um, I don't know. I, I've not. It's not something that's crossed my mind recently. Is you know, oh, maybe it's big enough and I can walk away. It's not like that. I don't feel like that. Um, I think I'm in it for the long haul. I don't think we've arrived yet. I think we we feel like we have, but actually I've had moments like that in the past. We've had moments like that in the past where we thought we've arrived. Um, in 2005, we had a million dollar world tour from CPL, 10 countries, one game, brilliant. Everyone thought, wow, we've arrived. Mm -hmm. It's on MTV, we've arrived, brilliant. Didn't didn't happen. Mm -hmm. 2007, we had the CGS, $50 million invested in esports, mainstream TV, live HD streaming TV on Sky Sports and Eurosport and ESPN and G4 and all these great shows. Didn't last, didn't work. We thought we'd arrived and we hadn't. 2009, 2010, we start seeing all these other games pop up. StarCraft 2 comes along, Dota comes along, League of Legends comes along. All these things start. I mean, literally back in the day, Horn was the game everyone said was going to be big. Remember those days? Yeah, yeah I do. And, and it didn't prove to be the case. But the difference for me now, more than anything before, is that four years ago, five years ago, we had Twitch come along. Mm. And since they've been involved, and others since as well, credit where it's due to you know YouTube and to MLG and everyone else that started the streaming mm -hmm. um, platforms owned back in the day as well. Because of that revolution, we've got more stability now. And... We're on an upward trajectory, which we haven't always been on before. It feels like we've ebbed and flowed. Yeah. And every time we've come back, it's been better than it was when we were at our height two years before. But we've had to have a massive dip in between mm -hmm. to come back up. For the last four or five years, it feels like we've been on an upward trajectory every single year. So I'm much more confident that we're on the right road and that we're you know, seeing these massive numbers now. But I don't think we've arrived. And I don't think we will for another few years. Now, do you think that the arrival point is really just time-based? Because my wife's a good. My wife is a molecular biologist. She has never played video games in her life, and she sums it up well because she watches Dota with me because she has no other choice. And she says, "You know, I get what's happening, but I don't know how to watch video games." And I think that she was sort of the last of this generation of people who never really played or were involved with them. Is there a way to break through to those people, do you think? Or do we just have to wait till they age out? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, I think a little bit of it is generational. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people my age don't care for watching esports. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm probably amongst the minority of my age group, I guess. If you look mm -hmm. at 40 to 50 year olds, the majority of them won't watch esports, but there is a hardcore group of people that do. Mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest change that we need is 
in generational terms, what will happen is, and, and this won't happen for a little while, and it might be two generations, but what will happen is the children of today's esports yeah. fans will grow up with esports being the norm, and that'll be fabulous. Their parents will then go on to become the decision makers at many companies. Right. Marketing, international companies, CEOs, managing directors, and what have you, and will then be in control of spending that money. Mm -hmm. And we'll see esports in the same way that the current set of marketing directors look at TV and radio, and it will be no different to them. Video streaming will be perfectly normal to them. So we do have to kind of wait for that to happen, but it, it is happening. That's the key point now. It might be a minority of the, of the people in that age range, but I'm 43, and I'm now in a position at Gfinity where I can make those kind of decisions, and I can employ people, and I can make changes and grow a business with the help of other people in that business. Mm -hmm. And influence others from other companies to spend money on esports mm -hmm. so it is starting to happen um but I, I think it's probably fair to say it will take another generation uh just because you guys are talking about it in chat uh red eye said he's 43 i last i checked i think i'm 32 my wife says i'm 32 i thought i was 31 um but we're <laughs> we're about 11 or 12 <laughs> years apart I, I, am i wrong Do you, don't you stop like caring after you hit like 20 25 yeah like, yeah. like I, I think i might have celebrated 25 and then after that i couldn't <laughs> i can't remember any birthday i think i remember my 40th but that's about it and then uh, it's about kids birthdays and not your own and yeah it absolutely is. um but so we are we have a different gap um uh, but I, I i guess i have a perspective of being in between the two major age groups which is nice um that's really all the questions that i had prepared for you today paul cool. i really appreciate you coming on the show um, you know, a, a thank you to you, a thank you to the guests who are here, guys. If you don't catch it live, thank you for watching on YouTube. Thank you for downloading the podcast. Thank you for listening on SoundCloud. Um, we're also live on Dota FM today as well, so make sure you guys are checking that out for TI. Uh, Dota FM will be providing audio coverage of the entire event in case you're stuck at work, uh, so check that out as well. And uh, do you have any last thoughts or uh, sign outs, shout outs before we leave? Uh, yeah, just thanks for you, for the opportunity to come and talk to you, and uh, to everyone that tuned in. Thanks to everyone um, that I work with at Gfinity. You guys are often astounding and brilliant at the same time, and I love working with you guys. It's a real pleasure every day to, do, to, to go into work. And uh, also to the Dota community for being very accepting. I know the majority of you have been great to me. I know there's a small minority I still have to win over, and um, you know I'll try and do that as best as I can at, at the international. And for those of you that don't like me or don't want me to be on the show, I apologize, but, you know, you can't please everyone in life. So have fun with whatever you do and, you know, enjoy the international for whatever you get out of it. Whichever way you want to experience it is fine. Do, do, enjoy the TI the way that you want to enjoy it. I 100% could not agree with that more. Um, again, thank you. I, this has been great. Uh, as somebody who has always wanted to be in esports uh, and dreams of working for studios one day. It has been great having you here. Listening to the things you say, I think it's going to help a lot of people. Um, and I am very excited about seeing what you bring, the storylines especially, to TI5, guys. So make sure that you uh, stick around. Check out our sponsors, Razor and Betway.com. And make sure you tune in to TI5 as Mr. Red Eye will be there taking us through all the action. It's going to be a good time. Make sure you check us out on Twitter, at Paul Chaloner. And uh, at Toffee, good job, buddy. Dota 2. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Play more Dota. And as always, Toffee's out. I'm going to give it a second and then I will cut once the stream catches up. All right, here we go. All right. Thank you so much.